Well, hi everyone. Well, there's certainly been a lot of new developments regarding the Teton Pass embankment failure, or a catastrophic failure that occurred this past weekend. And there's been a lot of new developments. If you haven't checked out my first video, I'll put a link in the description. It gives a lot of background information. What I want to describe in this video is what the Wyoming DOT has stated that they're doing. And I think there are a lot of concerns, quite frankly, some, some big red flags here that should be addressed. I haven't seen them addressed in uh, reporting up to date or from the statements from Wyoming DOT in their press releases. So I'll just go over that today. First, I'd like to mention there's been a lot of great reporting from Jackson Hole News and Guide. I'm going to put a link to their recent article about this situation in the description to this video. And I want to go over some of these key quotes from representatives of Wyoming DOT regarding their plans to reopen the roadway to traffic. So here's a quote from Bob Hammond with Wyoming DOT. He gave his first estimate of how long it would take to build a temporary fix on the pass. Weeks, not months. Now keep in mind, right after this failure occurred this past weekend, they had no timeline for reopening the roadway. Stakes are already in the ground directing the construction of 611 feet of new road just on the inside of the curve that slid. Workers from Evans Construction and its sister company, HK Contractors out of Idaho Falls, are on double shifts. About 10 people are working around the clock on the project. Bob Hammond Wydot's resident engineer in the Jackson District said the department is making every effort to balance the need to reopen the highway with the need to do so safely. Wydot scoped the new road alignment Sunday after consulting with geologists, surveyors, and contractors. Geologists will drill to investigate the area and confirm its stability. All I can say is, is wow, these studies take a lot of time. How, how could they just spend a day after the failure and say, yep, this is what we're going to do? I mean, that, that's what they're saying. And uh, I'll tell you why I think that decision process uh, certainly needs to be questioned. And I think there should be some better explanations forthcoming from Wyoming DOT. I mean, after all, they're the ones apparently that didn't recognize that this embankment was going to fail catastrophically. By all available accounts, they were treating this as a maintenance issue. And they did a temporary repair of the cracks in the roadway and they were planning to reopen the roadway had it not been for a mudslide a couple miles down the road. So in this sense, they got extremely lucky. You know, I've been a geotechnical engineer for the past 38 years. And I do a lot of construction related consulting. So there's this concept of a near miss accident. And that is something happened on the construction site that could have damaged property or injured or killed someone. For example, let's say a crane boom collapses and it falls to the ground but nobody gets hurt and some companies would just say, oh, we got lucky and would move on and repair the equipment and continue with the construction. More safety-minded contractors, which are the type I work with, would consider that episode as if somebody had gotten seriously injured or worse and conduct a full investigation so that they not only know what happened, but also figure out what has to be done in the future to prevent such an occurrence happening again. And I think that idea needs to be applied here. There's absolutely no way that anyone in the industry, in my opinion, could quickly come to a determination as to not only what caused this failure, what other areas may be moving still, and what is the best way to get traffic reopened on this roadway. But now we have this meeting yesterday with Wyoming Transportation Commission, and they've approved this plan to get this road reopened within two weeks. They indicate they've awarded a $430,000 emergency contract to Evans Construction. Wyoming DOT crews are hoping to have the detour in place within two weeks, weather permitting. More details about specific weight, width, or other traffic restrictions will be announced as they are finalized. So based on earlier statements, it sounds like this roadway section, this temporary section, if you will, is going to be limited to vehicle traffic, no big trucks, no heavy equipment, but we'll see on that. Wyoming DOT geology crews have been drilling into the slide area and investigating the soil properties to confirm the cause of the landslide and to collect better data for potential reconstruction. Uh, and again, all I can say is, wow. Here's a picture of a drill crew apparently working on this slide area 
to sample the subsurface materials to determine what may have caused this failure. Now, I've been responsible for many, many geotechnical investigations, and it's a time-consuming process. You have to set up the drill rig. That's not always easy, especially in a situation like this, so other equipment has to be brought in to create leveling pads in many cases. The drill crew has to set up the rig. It takes time to actually drill and sample, so you're talking maybe one or two holes a day could be completed, but that's just to get the samples. Those samples have to be sent to a laboratory, various tests like index tests, strength tests, consolidation tests need to be performed, and that's time consuming. So in round numbers, based on my experience, it would typically take two to three weeks to perform the field investigation at a minimum, and another two or three weeks to complete all the lab testing. And certainly some analysis can be done as this process is moving forward, but really you can't perform your full analysis until all the data has, has been compiled. So again, that's another couple of week process minimum. So roughly you're talking about two months just to get a handle on what happened out there and what's the best path forward. And by the Wyoming DOT account, they're gonna have this road section reopen probably before many of the samples are even returned to the laboratory for testing. So something doesn't seem right to me here. And by the way, this measure that they're employing to get this roadway reopened looks exactly like what they were doing prior to the failure in terms of flattening out the other side of the embankment to create a shoe fly or a connection adjacent to the road section that failed. This is another photo of that. Now I wanna give better information as to the location of this slide. As I mentioned in the previous video, it was at milepost 12.8. And here's an image that shows the location of the slide. And I appreciate uh, those of you provided coordinates for this slide location. I agree that this is the area here. And if you just draw a straight line from one curve to the next adjacent to this area that failed this past weekend, you're looking at uh, 158 meters or just under 500 feet. So that meshes with their statement of a new section being 611 feet long. So in rough numbers, that looks to be where that's gonna go. And that coincides with these earlier photos of what they were attempting to do to begin with. So let's just zoom in on this area here a little bit. See this embankment fill section at the sharpest part of the curve. Some of you suggested that they should be looking at a bridge to connect at the lower portion of the slope at the base of that hairpin turn. To me, that seems like something that should be considered. I don't know what all the grades are there, but that seems like that would be a viable solution if, if the grades can match on either side or they could be made to match fairly closely as far as uh, the grades to the approach to each side of the bridge. Now we can see that the area of the embankment that failed this past weekend is about 1,600 feet upslope from this Trail Creek. So as I mentioned, by all appearances, in my opinion, the DOT really didn't appreciate the fact that this embankment was gonna fail catastrophically. And there's this video that I just came across. Maybe some of you have seen it. This was posted to the governor of Wyoming's Facebook page, and it shows ongoing failure of this section of the embankment. So let's just run this real quick. Well, I don't know who took this video. They say the cameraman always survives, that's the meme. I wouldn't be standing anywhere close to where this person filming this failure was standing. You can see cracks directly ahead of him for a section of the embankment that's probably already failed or probably failed shortly after this video was taken. So I don't know if this video was taken with anybody associated with the Wyoming DOT you know, they've closed access. You can see the orange barrels on the other side. So again, it's speculation on my part that this was somebody associated with either the construction crews or Wyoming DOT staff. But uh, 
that tells me they didn't understand how risky that situation was. And also a couple other observations. You could, you could hear, I guess, how dry that fill is. And you can hear pieces of maybe cobbles or gravel uh, ping off the steel guardrail. That's the, the, the popping noise. You can hear this ravelly sound as the material goes down slope. So I don't have a clear handle on what this material is. It appears to be more sandy than I initially thought. But uh, it seems to be bone dry. And if this embankment failed because of all the recent snow melt and rainfall, which is what produced these nearby mud flows over the roadway, the upper portion of the field appears to be very dry. So that makes me wonder if essentially the foundation soils underneath this embankment became saturated and started to move, which initiated the entire slope failure here. Now, as other of you have pointed out, these drone images of the roadway at the time that these cracks started to open up at the end of last week, prior to the failure on Saturday, you could see this darker portion of asphalt. And that appears to be a previous patch, pretty much exactly where this failure ultimately occurred. So it would appear that there's been ongoing movement over many years or cer certainly months in this section of the embankment. Here's some other photos showing how wide these cracks are with the lowering of the roadway section. The part of the image to the right, that's the area that failed down slope. Just another view of that cracking. You know, these cracks form an arc, a semicircular arc, which is indicative of a failure of a large mass of material. So again, why somebody would think that they could just patch this asphalt and reopen the roadway to traffic just blows my mind. Apparently, the early warning that these road sections were cracking was due to a crash of a motorcyclist who was riding, looks like a Goldwing with a trailer, and hit these cracks and, and went down. And uh, you could tell those cracks, in many cases, were parallel to the direction of travel. And I ride motorcycles, and that's not a situation you want to have in, to encounter because that lip in the pavement will catch your tire and more often than not cause you to crash. But here was a statement following that crash from Wyoming DOT. Part of the reason for the motorcycle crash was the crack and drop in the road, said Stephanie Harsha, a spokesman for District 3 of the Wyoming Department of Transportation. Geologists and engineers sent to the area Thursday noticed that the crack and that drop started to move a lot, she said. A paving crew temporarily patched the site and began, and traffic began moving again along the highway that night, she said. So there it is. I, I had a question of whether any geologists or engineers had been on site prior to this failure, and according to this statement, there were. So how could they not recognize that there was a major slope failure that was likely to occur based on the visual evidence alone? Now, in my previous video, I estimated the height of this embankment. So I drew an arrow at the top of the roadway and estimated the shoulder to shoulder width was about 40 feet. So that meant the slope height was about 120 feet. And I had estimated that that slope angle was two to one. And many of you pointed out you thought it was a lot steeper than that. So I drew these other arrows and that slope that failed looks like it's close to one to one, which, ex which is extremely steep. And now you've got this near vertical face here that's going to be subject to progressive ongoing failures. So as the slope attempts to reach equilibrium into a, a flatter configuration, more and more material is gonna fail in the embankment and go downhill. Here's the section of Highway 22 that's now closed to traffic. The detour adds about an hour for people in the area traveling from, from Wilson, Wyoming to Victor, Idaho. As I mentioned, drilling and sampling soils for geotechnical engineering takes time. I wanna show you a short video here of what it takes to drill in preparation of sampling the soil. Here's a dry sample, SPT sample. There's other kinds of samples that are called Shelby tubes. They're thin wall, pushed hydraulically to get high quality soil sample. 
and those are subject to triaxial shear tests, consolidation tests, high-end tests that take many, many days, if not a few weeks, to perform. And you really need to perform these higher level tests to get a true understanding of the strength of the materials involved in not only the embankment, but the foundation soils for the embankment. One thing I haven't heard any mention of is geotechnical instrumentation. Now there's evidence and statements made by Wyoming DOT officials that this area has been sliding in the past. And I haven't seen any mention of any geotechnical instrumentation having been installed in this area to better monitor what was going on with this slope or other slopes in the area. One common way to detect movement in a slope or the foundation soils below a slope is to install what's called an inclinometer casing. You can see here you've got offsetting sets of grooves 90 degrees apart. You put a probe with wheels that are on springs that go into these slots. There's an accelerometer inside this probe so you can measure the orientation of the probe along various sections of the pipe. This is what this probe looks like in the cable. And you can generate graphs like this that show if you have zones of horizontal movement in the material that you're monitoring for, say, an embankment. Another type of useful geotechnical instrumentation is a piezometer, and that's to measure, and that's used to measure pore water pressures. If you have increasing pore water pressures, that typically means you have decreasing strength in the surrounding soils. And early indications of increasing pore water pressures or higher, or higher piezometric levels would be indicative of the potential for a slope failure. So I'd say they should strongly consider installing this geotechnical instrumentation if they're not already doing it as part of this current investigation. But given the timeline, I don't know that they are doing that. And again, I don't see how they can possibly have enough information at this juncture to be telling people that they're gonna have this temporary section completed so the roadway can be open to traffic within two weeks. So I'll continue to follow this story. If you like these kind of updates, please hit those like, subscribe, and notification buttons. I've got a link in the description for a free digital download of the biggest civil engineering disasters of the past 100 years. I wanna send a shout out to the channel members. Channel members get early previews of my regular videos, the breaking news stories I typically get out right away, but please consider becoming a member of the channel and supporting uh, my efforts here. I like to call things as I see them based on my years of engineering experience and practice. And uh, I think I can come away with some observations that other people aren't really picking up on with stories like this. Also want to send out a shout out to those of you who provide super thanks. That's another great way to support the channel. So thanks very much, everyone.